Good evening and welcome. My name is Albert Timms. I'm the director of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Minnesota, and it's my honor, privilege to welcome you this evening to the 21st annual Scylla Lecture. The Scylla Lecture is funded by the generous endowment uh, from the late Otto Scylla and his wife Helen. Helen is here with us this evening along with her family, her son Steve and her daughter Alice and their family. So I'd like to welcome you especially, hey, uh, Helen and family. <laughs> we do certainly thank you. This is a real treat. Um, the Scylla Lecture is the signature event sponsored by the Scylla Center for the Study of Media Ethics and Law which since its founding in 1984 has stayed on the cutting edge of legal and ethical issues affecting the news media. The Scylla Center sponsors a variety of events throughout the year, including an annual spring forum on media ethics, which earlier this year faced, featured journalist Seth Moonkin and Star Tribune readers representative Kate Perry on the assault on media independence, as well as other programs on government surveillance and digital privacy, and truth-telling and campaign advertising. The Cecilla Center also supports graduate students and law students in their research. These students help write and edit a quarterly Scylla bulletin, which is available outside the auditorium, by the way, and available also through the Scylla Center website. The work of the Scylla Center is led by Professor Jane Kirtley. Jane holds the Scylla Chair in Media Ethics and Law and is director of the Scylla Center. As many of you probably know, Jane is a frequently quoted expert and commentator on media law and media ethics issues and speaks here in the Twin Cities and in fact all over the world on issues ranging from the controversy over the publication of the Mohammed cartoons to balancing freedom of information and national security. She will be delivering uh, a keynote address in the Applied Ethics Conference in Ankara, Turkey later this month. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kirtley. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll give a moment for the stragglers to find their seats. If they were my students, they'd be in trouble. Um, thank you again for joining us tonight. Concerns about unauthorized disclosure of classified information have prompted heated debate about the role of a free press in American society as the government has scrambled to stem the leaks and to determine the identity of the leakers. You may remember that back in April, the Central Intelligence Agency fired Mary McCarthy, an analyst who is accused of having provided classified information to Washington Post reporters about secret US-operated prisons in Europe where terrorist suspects have been detained. Almost simultaneously, reports surfaced that the FBI was trying to examine nearly 200 boxes containing papers belonging to the late investigative journalist Jack Anderson. A spokesman for the FBI was quoted as saying that the agency has determined that among the papers there are a number of U.S. government documents that contain classified information and contending that no private person may possess classified documents that were illegally provided to them. Reaction to these incidents was swift and outspoken. Some commentators accused McCarthy of being a traitor and suggested that the reporters and news organizations who published the classified information were no better than traitors themselves and should be prosecuted. Others used these incidents as an object lesson in the basic principle that it is up to the government to keep its secrets if it can, but it is up to journalists to ferret out as much information as they can. These are issues are neither new nor are they novel. Trying to balance legitimate concerns about maintaining the secrecy of properly classified information against the role of the free press to act as watchdog on the government and to keep the public informed raises genuine and compelling issues and challenges. But extending the espionage laws to prosecute journalists, those who disclose classified information but who are not engaged in classic espionage, would, as Judge T.S. Ellis III, who is currently presiding over an espionage case in Northern Virginia, would veer into uncharted waters. To help us navigate those uncharted waters, I'm happy to introduce our Scylla lecturer, Jeffrey Stone. Jeffrey Stone has been a member of the law faculty at the University of Chicago since 1973. During that time, he served as dean of the law school and provost of the University of Chicago. 
He teaches primarily in the areas of constitutional law and evidence and writes principally in the field of constitutional law. His most recent book, Perilous Times, received the Robert F. Kennedy Book Award for 2005. It will be available for purchase and book signing following this lecture. And now please join me in welcoming Professor Jeffrey Stone. Thank you. I'm delighted uh, to be here. I should begin, however, by offering my condolences for today's events. Uh, you should have known better than to invite a Chicago Cubs fan to uh, Minneapolis uh, on a day when you're in the playoffs. Uh, I um, want to talk this evening, as Jane said, um, about the issue of national security and freedom of the press, uh, an issue that has long been a daunting challenge for the United States uh, throughout our history, uh, but which has raised new issues uh, in the context of the war on terrorism. Uh, in particular, as Professor Kirtley just suggested, um, disclosures of classified information, uh, in particular the revelation of the President's authorization to the National Security Agency uh, to engage in uh, electronic surveillance of communications, of both uh, telephonic and email, uh, relating to issues of national security without going through the formal legal channels, uh, raised serious questions both about the legality of the president's conduct and also about how we balance this uh, trade-off between the government's legitimate interest in national security and the public's legitimate need to know what its government is doing. And what I want to do is to try to explain uh, some of the difficulties that arise in the context of framing uh, legal principles that will enable us to work our way through these problems. And as you'll see, it turns out that it's often much more difficult to define those rules uh, than you might think. Uh, we frame it typically as saying, well, we have to balance national security against the public's right to know. Uh, but it turns out that framing the issue that way has actually virtually nothing to do with the way the legal issues have evolved over time or with the doctrines that have emerged in the law under the First Amendment in trying to figure out how best to address this problem. So what I want to do is to analyze with you uh, the three components of the problem from a First Amendment perspective. The first is the liability or potential liability of public employees for leaking information in violation of federal law. To what extent does a public employee have a First Amendment right to disclose classified information to a reporter for the purpose of enabling the reporter to publish that information? Second, I want to look at the question of the potential liability of the press, say the New York Times or the Washington Post, for actually disclosing, for publishing such information. To what extent may the New York Times or the Washington Post or a similar component of the press be held criminally responsible for publishing such classified national security information? And the third question I want to look at, and as you'll see, it falls between the other two from the legal analysis, is the question whether reporters or journalists may be held legally accountable for obtaining information from public employees where the disclosure of the information by the public employee is itself unlawful, and where the reporter's purpose is to enable the publication of that material by the press. So in thinking about the issue of public employees, and in some sense this is the essential foundation for any understanding of this question, because insofar as we're talking about a process, the public employee gives the information to the reporter who gives it to his or her employer who publishes it for the benefit of the larger public, the second and third steps of course never happen unless the public employee violates the law and reveals the information to the reporter in the first place. So if the public employee 
is constrained effectively, then the information never reaches the reporter and never reaches the newspaper and never reaches the public. So in some sense, this is the most important linchpin of the entire process. Now, one way to begin thinking about this is by asking about the rights of private individuals to reveal information to reporters to enable reporters to write stories. When is a non-public employee, when is any of you, some of you are public employees because you work for the University of Minnesota, but those of you who are not in that fortunate position, um, to what extent could you be held liable for turning over information to a reporter with the purpose in mind of enabling that reporter ultimately to publish the information? Well, it turns out the First Amendment gives a very broad protection to the ordinary citizen to provide information for purposes of publication. There are very narrow circumstances where the individual citizen may be held responsible legally for disclosing such information. Uh, the most common example would be situations like if you reveal to a reporter factually false information. Are those Oakland fans? What is that? factually false information about another individual with the intent of having the reporter publish that factually false information, which would constitute a libel, you might be held accountable for having knowingly and intentionally provided that information to the reporter. The most important situation, however, in which a private individual might be held legally accountable for disclosing information to a reporter would be if the private individual has entered into a voluntary agreement with some other person not to disclose information. So for example, if you take a job with a private employer in which you are a salesperson and you agree as a condition of employment that you will not disclose the company's customer list to any outside entity and you then choose for whatever reason of your own to violate that private contract and you turn that customer list over to a trade magazine which publishes the customer list and your employer fires you and sues you for breach of contract, you're in trouble. Courts can hold you to your contractual agreement not to disclose information even though that is clearly a restraint on your freedom of speech but you can waive your constitutional rights and in a situation in which you make such an agreement, in almost all circumstances you will be held accountable for breach of that contract. Now this is relevant because public employees who take jobs with the government as opposed to a private employer and who are accepting positions in which the government has an interest in the speech of those public employees will typically be asked or indeed required as a condition of employment to agree to, restri to restrict their speech in certain ways. So a simple example would be if you are an employee of the Internal Revenue Service, um, you might be required to sign an agreement that you will not disclose to anyone outside the Internal Revenue Service confidential tax returns submitted by individual taxpayers. Now the question is to what extent the government, like a private employer, can enforce against you those agreements. A private employer can ask you to agree to virtually any waiver of constitutional rights. And if you choose to enter into the agreement with the private employer, that waiver will almost invariably be held legally enforceable. If you take a job and you promise never to have an abortion or never to practice your religion and, and you make a private agreement to that effect, courts will generally enforce it because it's not the government itself imposing upon you the obligation. You have voluntarily accepted it. So the government could argue in the situation of hiring its employees, we're no different than a private employer. We can offer people jobs on the condition that they agree not to disclose any information that they learn in the course of their employment or for that matter 
not practice their religion or not have an abortion or never assert their rights under the Fourth Amendment. Because if you don't want to make that agreement, you just don't take the job in the same way that you wouldn't take the job with a private employer. And you can see that there's a problem here. Even though private employers are allowed to make these agreements with their employees, when the government is concerned, we have a greater concern. For one thing, the Constitution regulates the actions of the government, not the actions of private employers. The Constitution is a document that regulates the government's relations both within the government and with its citizens. It does not regulate the relations between private individuals. Therefore, you might argue, if you were the potential public employee, it violates my right as an American citizen or as an individual to be expected to give up my right to abortion or my right to object to unreasonable searches and seizures or my freedom of speech or my freedom of religion as a condition of accepting government employment. And indeed, unlike the private employer, the government is not generally allowed to insist that public employees waive what otherwise would be their constitutional rights as a condition of public employment. Indeed, the doctrine that goes under the name of the doctrine of unconstitutional conditions essentially says that the government may not extract from individuals even voluntary agreements to agree to waive what otherwise would be their constitutional rights as a condition of accepting some benefit from the government, which might be in the form of public employment, or it might be in the form of welfare benefits, it might be in the form of tax deductions, uh, zoning waivers, whatever. The government can't say, if you want to receive welfare benefits, you have to agree to vote for the governor. Um, that would be an unconstitutional condition on your ability to receive welfare benefits may seem perfectly obvious to you, but in fact, it took courts a very long time to understand this point. Now, what complicates the point is that although the government may not extract waivers of constitutional rights from citizens in the same way that private individuals may do so, that does not mean that the government may never extract waivers of constitutional rights from individuals. And two factors are most relevant in figuring out the circumstances in which the government may constitutionally insist that public employees agree to waive their rights, and particularly their free speech rights. One of them has to do with the government's ability to operate effectively and efficiently. When the government regulates citizens generally and says to people, you may not have abortions, you may not advocate opposition to the administration, uh, you may not view obscene movies, uh, it's regulating all citizens as sovereign. And ordinarily, the government has very limited power to intrude upon First, upon First Amendment or general constitutional rights when it operates as sovereign. But when it operates as an employer, it often has very different interests at stake, much more focused upon its ability to function, and indeed, similar to the kinds of interests that private employers often will be attempting to further when they insist that individuals waive their rights. So, for example, if you go back to the uh, hypothetical I offered earlier about the person who accepts employment in the Internal Revenue Service and who is asked to agree as a condition of employment that he not disclose confidential tax returns, it's easy to understand why the government would want to extract that concession from the employee and why it makes sense for the government to do that if it's to operate effectively. The Internal Revenue Service depends in large part upon individual citizens understanding that when they file their tax returns, that information is confidential and will not find its way readily into uh, the newspaper. And therefore, in order to make that work, the government has to insist that its employees abide by that agreement and not disclose such information. So the court, in attempting to strike this balance, has essentially said that although the government does not have freedom to extract concessions of constitutional rights 
in the way a private employer would, that is without regard to any constitutional limitations, it may do so, so long as it has a reasonable justification for asking for the waiver, and so long as the government's interest is sufficiently important to justify its insistence on the waiver. And a good example of a situation where we would presumptively uphold such a restriction is the example of the IRS employee who is asked to give up what otherwise would be a First Amendment right to publicize uh, a confidential tax return. If a newspaper in some way got access to that tax return, it could publish the information with very little ability of the government to punish or restrain it because it is not a government employee and it hasn't agreed to waive any of its rights, whereas the public employee is in a very different position and has agreed to waive his rights and has been asked to waive those rights in circumstances where the government's action is thought to be reasonable. A second factor that plays into these circumstances, and that's worth noting, is that the government will sometimes argue, particularly in cases involving confidential information, that where the public employee is, is asked not to disclose information that he or she would not have known about if it were not for the fact of government employment, that there's really no restriction on that individual's First Amendment rights. That is, that the only way the employee could ever possibly know the information is by virtue of their employment, that no other citizen would ever be in a position to reveal that information because they would never have access to it. And therefore, unlike someone who's being told you cannot, for example, be a member of the Communist Party if you are a public employee, which is a right other citizens do have, and so you're asking the individual employee to give up something that other people have, if what you're asking them to give up is only the power to reveal a confidential tax return, which no other citizen has access to anyway, then you're not really asking them to give up much that really attaches to the First Amendment itself. So for both of those reasons, reasonableness and the fact that the information would not be available to the individual but for the fact that they're a public employee, government is, in fact, in most circumstances, allowed to restrict the disclosure by public employees of confidential information. Now, as soon as we say that, we have to realize that there is an implicit trade-off taking place between the interests of the government in preserving confidentiality for the purposes of effective operation of the government, on the one hand, and the public's interest in knowing, on the other. In the ordinary case of a confidential tax return, we may assume that if it's an ordinary run-of-the-mill individual, that the public has no particular interest in knowing the contents of that individual's tax return. But suppose the tax return is filed by a candidate for public office, and it reveals information about that candidate that is very much relevant to his fitness for public office and to the decision of potential voters as to whether they would, in fact, support that candidate. Now the information could be of potentially very significant public importance. And the question is, what do we do in that setting with the public employee who has agreed to waive his First Amendment rights, who has gained access to the information only by virtue of his public employment, where the government has put in place a rule that prohibits the disclosure of confidential tax returns, but where the public employee says, this is really important for the public to know. And I don't think I should be bound by my promise because here, I think, the public value of disclosure outweighs the government's legitimate interest in confidentiality. Well, that's the problem that arises routinely, to come back to the problem that we're starting with, in the situation of classified information and public employees. When someone working, say, for the National Security Agency knows that the president has authorized the NSA to engage in surveillance of electronic communications and that that information has been deemed classified, 
on the premise that its disclosure could be harmful to the national security, that employee may say, well, let's see, I agreed to abide by this rule, but I think that the public really should know that the president has authorized this program. Perhaps because I think the program is unlawful, perhaps because I think it's simply an important matter that the public should be able to debate, perhaps because I think having such a program impedes the national security, whatever. The employee says, I believe this information should be public. Okay, so one way to address this question would be to have the government in making its classification decisions limited to classifying information only if it makes an independent judgment itself that the public disclosure of the information, the value of the public disclosure of the information is outweighed by the interest of national security. That is, we ask the classifier, the person who puts this top secret stamp on the document, not just to decide if publication might be detrimental to the national security, but to decide whether publication, the harm that would flow to national security from publication outweighs the public value of the disclosure of the information. A very different question. So that would be one way to address the question. And then to say, well, at least within the government, within the classification system, we've decided on that balance. Another way to do it would be, of course, to allow public employees to disclose information that is classified, that they've agreed not to disclose, and then to have courts determine after the fact whether the public employee, in fact, was justified in making the decision to disclose the information by having the court determine whether the public employee could appropriately be fired or criminally prosecuted for the decision to disclose the information. Now that would require a balance, a real balance between the value of public disclosure and the harm to national security. And it would be easy to imagine a world in which we expected either classifiers or courts to serve that function. In fact, that's not the way the law has developed. To the contrary, the way the law has developed is that the government may in fact hold public employees to their agreement not to disclose confidential or in this case classified information, period. That it is not required that the government classify only if a judgment is made that the value of disclosure is outweighed by the harm to national security and the public employee is ordinarily not permitted to defend the disclosure on the ground that the public value of the disclosure outweighs the harm to national security. Now that might be surprising. You might say, well, gee, in an ideal world, we should be focusing on that balance. And the reason we do not focus on that balance is because in order to, work the, to make the world work, we sometimes need simple rules. And we don't want courts having, as a matter of First Amendment law, constantly having to decide whether any time an individual public employee decides to disclose classified or otherwise confidential information, the public value of the information outweighs the government's interest in national security or confidentiality in the IRS system. It just would create a morass of situations where courts would have to make these ad hoc judgments very difficult to make as to whether the public value outweighs the harm to the IRS or the harm to the national security. So to have a simple rule, easy to enforce, that everyone knows, the deal is if you take a job with the government, you can be asked to agree not to disclose confidential information or classified information. And if you violate that agreement, you can be both fired and prosecuted for doing so. Now, we don't actually go quite so far as to give the government carte blanche to say anything it wants to classify is classified. In order to enforce this requirement against public employees, the government clearly under the law has to satisfy at least two requirements. It has to show that the, inf that the disclosure of the information 
does have the potential to harm the national security. And it has to show that the government had taken reasonable steps to keep the information confidential. If those two requirements are satisfied, though, public employees ordinarily can be compelled to keep the information confidential and can be punished for revealing it. An example of this situation was Daniel Ellsberg, who leaked the Pentagon Papers. In doing so, Ellsberg clearly violated the classification status of the Pentagon Papers and was, in fact, prosecuted by the federal government for having done so. And Ellsberg undoubtedly would have been convicted for having done that, but for the fact that the Nixon administration uh, chose to have the plumbers break into his psychiatrist's office, which ultimately led the federal judge to dismiss the case on the grounds of gross misconduct. But the fact is, for leaking the Pentagon Papers, Daniel Ellsberg could have been criminally punished on the theory that he gained access to the papers as a public employee, had agreed not to disclose them, violated the agreement. There was at least a potential harm to the national security from the disclosure of the information, and the government had attempted to keep them confidential previously. Now, there's one other exception to the circumstances in which the government may punish the employee, which is worth noting, and that is the situation where the employee discloses information that even though classified, and even though the disclosure might in fact have the potential to harm the national security, reveals government illegality. The government has no legitimate interest in shielding from the public its own wrongdoing. In a self-governing society, the public is ultimately the governor and the public officials are accountable to the public. And therefore, if a public employee, despite having agreed not to disclose classified information, discloses that information in circumstances where the revelation is of unlawful conduct by the government, then that public employee should have a defense, as they should because the law is actually unclear on this, should have a defense to any prosecution or any firing under the First Amendment on the ground that the government has no legitimate interest in prohibiting the revelation of government wrongdoing. This is directly relevant to the disclosure of the National Security Agency policy because many people, myself included, believe that that policy was a violation of federal law and that the disclosure of the information therefore should be protected by the First Amendment even for the public employees who were involved in leaking the information because it disclosed an unlawful program. But the basic presumption in these cases is that a public employee has waived his rights, the government can legitimately expect him to waive his rights, and that the public employee can be held accountable for violating that agreement without regard to whether the public interest is served by the violation of the law. And that's a critical component. And the reason for that is simplicity. The reason for that is practicality. It's simply saying we want to enable the government to regulate its employees in an organized, simple, straightforward, easy to follow way. And one of the ways we achieve this is say you made the deal, you have to abide by the deal in the vast majority, at least, of circumstances. Now the second question I want to mention is when the press discloses information that has unlawfully been leaked by a public employee, such as the Pentagon Papers or the NSA surveillance or the secret prisons in Eastern Europe. Now the one obvious argument in this situation is if the government can criminally punish the public employee for disclosing the information, then obviously it can prohibit a newspaper from publishing the information. It's the same point. And this is an argument that's routinely made in defense of the proposition that newspapers can be criminally punished for disclosing classified information 
on the same logic that public employees can be criminally punished for revealing that information to reporters. And as I hope will be obvious already, there's a deep fallacy in that connection between the two situations. Because the reason for allowing the public employee to be restricted turns on two critical factors. That the public employee agreed to abide by a restriction, which the press has not agreed to abide by. And second, we have decided to give the government a simple rule to regulate the conduct of its employees. But that simple rule is not based on a balance of the trade-off between the value of the disclosure to the public and the interest in national security. To the contrary, we allow the government to keep the information confidential and to enforce that confidentiality against its employees as long as the publication of the information might have a detrimental effect on national security, which ignores the entire other half of the balance, which is what is the public value of the disclosure. So if you go back to the disclosure of the tax return of the political candidate, it's obvious that it may be the case that the public disclosure is much more important than preserving the confidentiality in that particular situation. And the same problem arises repeatedly in the context of national security. For example, suppose that the government has a classified study that shows that the ports of the United States are not adequately protected against potential terrorists, and it gives detail about all of the various ports. And that information is published by the New York Times, which has obtained it through an unlawful leak by a public employee. Well, it's easy to see why the publication of that information might harm the national security. It will inform potential terrorists about targets that they might not otherwise have been aware of. On the other hand, disclosing that information to the public will enable the public to demand that the government, their representatives, take aggressive action to redress the situation and to make the ports safer. So here it's easy to see that that becomes a much more complicated question as to whether or not the balance is in favor of publication or confidentiality. So the first point I want to make about the newspaper situation is that you should not be captive to the fallacious argument that is often made, which says, start from the proposition that we can publish, that we can punish the public employee. It then follows that, of course, we can punish the newspaper. That's a totally fallacious argument, and it's very important to understand that they are totally different situations from a First Amendment perspective. And that the reason we give the government the deference we give it in regulating its employees is not because we have made a judgment that the constitutional interests of the nation are served by maintaining the confidentiality, but that the employment interests of the government are served, which is a very different question. Now, can a newspaper ever be punished for disclosing classified government information, which it has obtained as a result of an unlawful leak by a public employee? One simple answer might be no. The Constitution provides that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Any law purporting to prohibit the press from publishing information is by definition a law abridging the freedom of the press. End of discussion. But as always, it never turns out to be quite that simple. The problem is to define what is the freedom of press that the government may not abridge. And it doesn't necessarily mean the freedom to publish anything you feel like. It may mean that the freedom of the press is a term of art that has to be defined. Congress can't abridge it, but we first we have to know what it is. And it may or may not cover the disclosure of classified information and the publication of classified information. Now, interestingly, in more than 200 years of American history, the United States government has never prosecuted the press for the publication of classified government information. The fact is, this has been an absolute taboo, partly because, for the most part, the press has been reasonably responsible about not publishing information that would truly be dramatically detrimental 
to the national security when it, in fact, has had possession of such information. And partly it's been due to the fact that the government has exercised restraint and has not chosen to prosecute the press in these circumstances, which makes the threat that Professor Kirtley identified earlier of the current administration to prosecute the New York Times and the Washington Post for their publication of information about the NSA surveillance or the prisons in Eastern Europe unprecedented in American history and truly dangerous because of the effort to intimidate the media into not publishing information which might in fact be of great public value even though it is classified. The fact of classification only tells us that disclosure might be harmful to the national security, not that it is not justified to have that information published anyway. So the question then is, well, when can the government, when is the national security interest sufficiently great to justify a criminal prosecution of the press? And the answer I would give you is, has two components to it. First is that the government may not criminally prosecute the press for the publication even of classified information obtained through an unlawful leak unless the government can show that there is a clear and imminent danger of a grave harm to the national security, a very high standard to meet. Now, here you might flip the question and say, no, wait a minute, why do we apply such a high standard? After all, whether the national security interests outweigh the public interest is a balance. The right way to resolve that question is essentially to say, well, let's see, what's the national security harm? What's the public value of the disclosure? Let's weigh one against the other, and let's decide whether, in fact, the publication of the information serves the ultimate national interest or not. And if it does not serve that interest, then we should balance in favor of the government and make it a crime to publish. But instead, we have a rule that clearly is much more protective of free speech. It essentially says we will conclusively presume that the public's right to know trumps the national security unless the government can prove a clear, imminent, and grave threat to the national security. Now, the reason for that is that we don't generally trust the government or the government's motives when it comes to making claims about national security. We know that government officials for a whole variety of reasons, will often inflate national security claims, both to protect themselves, to cover up misdeeds or misjudgments, and simply to serve what they regard as their function, because their interest is much more in keeping the nation safe than it is in worrying about the public's right to know, because they'll get voted out of office if there's another 9-11 attack, not because they've managed to keep the public in the dark, about information that the public otherwise might not even know about. So the incentives of the government are always to inflate claims of national security, and therefore it's important to put a thumb heavily on the side of free speech in these circumstances. Moreover, if one is going to get the right balance between the public's right to know and the government's interest in protecting national security, if we start with the government having a high degree of authority to prohibit public employees from disclosing confidential information, then to sort of balance that out, we want to give the press a very aggressive right to publish that information when they, in fact, manage to get it in their possession. Otherwise, one would give too much weight to the government's interest in keeping this information from the public. Now, the second element of the test I want to mention, which is one that's much more controversial, and I would assert that even if there is a clear and imminent danger of a grave harm to the national security, that the government still cannot constitutionally punish the press for publishing classified information if that information is, in fact, a contribution to public debate. Now, this may seem somewhat counterintuitive, but it's worth taking a minute to explain. The examples that typically are given when we talk about situations 
where the government surely can prohibit the press from publishing classified information would be, for instance, the invasion plan immediately before the invasion is launched, or the location of troops on the battlefield at a particular moment in time. And those are situations where, in fact, it may be true that there is a clear and imminent danger of a grave harm to the national interest if that information were to be published, because it would put the invasion of the troops very much in jeopardy. But what also is true about those examples, which is often an unnoticed fact, is that the publication of that information at that moment in time has very little value to the public at that moment. Because there's nothing public deliberation can do about whether the invasion will go forward if it's imminent or about whether the troops should be in that particular location at that moment in time. So the disclosure of the information really doesn't contribute at all to the purposes of the First Amendment. It simply enables the enemy to take certain action against the government. Therefore, what makes those hypotheticals effective is both the fact that there is a serious government interest at stake and that the information is not of great value to public discourse. Now this fallacy of not paying attention to the value part, the contribution to public debate part of the analysis, goes all the way back to the very first Supreme Court decision that ever gave content to the First Amendment, where Justice Holmes used his famous example of a false cry of fire in a crowded theater. And Holmes offered that example for two purposes, partly to demonstrate that the First Amendment is not an absolute, that the freedom of speech doesn't mean the freedom to say anything at any time, in any place, in any manner, that you can be punished sometimes for speech. We have to define what the freedom of speech is that may not be abridged, but also as a basis for his clear and present danger test. He said, well, why is it that we can punish the false cry of fire in a crowded theater? Well, it's because that speech causes a clear and present danger of a mad dash to the exits in which people will be trampled, and the government has obviously a very great interest in prohibiting that. But what even Holmes neglected to note is that what makes the hypothetical work is not only the clear and present danger, but also the fact that the cry is false. If the cry had been true, if there really was a fire, even though there was a clear and present danger created of people being injured on the way to the exits, indeed the exact same danger would exist, we certainly would not regard the speech as punishable. And so what's necessary to apply this clear and present danger test, in fact, is not just harm, but also some judgment that the speech itself does not contribute in a significant way to public debate. Now, to prove this point, let me give you a difficult hypothetical. Suppose that the New York Times learns that American troops in Iraq have massacred 200 Iraqi insurgent prisoners of war, people we've captured. And the New York Times publishes this information even after having been told by the administration that if it publishes this information, the insurgents will capture 200 innocent Americans in Iraq and murder them in retaliation. And the New York Times publishes anyway. And so there's no question but the publication of this information creates a likely and imminent danger of a grave harm. And in fact, let's assume, just as the administration predicted, exactly that follows. And 200 innocent Americans are kidnapped and slaughtered. And the New York Times is prosecuted. I would argue the New York Times is protected by the First Amendment in the publication of that information, because despite the existence of a clear and present danger of grave harm, the fact is the public needs to know that its soldiers in Iraq have slaughtered 200 prisoners of war. And keeping that information from the American public has to be a violation of the First Amendment, because otherwise it would allow the government simply to mutilate the thought process of the community and prevent the public from holding accountable its officials, military officials and their commanders, for misfeasance or malfeasance. Okay, so what I'm arguing then is that, is that the press has extraordinary power and ability to publish classified information, even though the public employee could be put in jail for revealing the information. 
to the press. Now, the third situation, which I'll just mention briefly because I know I shouldn't stop, is the journalist. And in some ways, this is the most difficult of the three. There are three situations in which journalists may get information from a public employee unlawfully, to doing this simply. First, the journalist may bribe or coerce or defraud the public employee into revealing classified information. So the reporter says, I'll give you $10,000 in order to get you to turn over to me information about the national security. Or I'll kill your kids if you don't give me the information. Or deceives the individual into giving the information. That's one situation, one type of situation. And I would argue in those situations, the reporter who engages in those activities can be punished for bribery or fraud or threats, even though the reporter is attempting to get information that may be of great importance to the public. Because we, in general, do not allow reporters, as a First Amendment matter, to violate laws that are not directed specifically at the freedom of the press. So for example, if a reporter wants to wiretap a senator, in order to overhear a conversation in which the senator takes a bribe or wants to burgle the senator's home so he can rummage through the senator's desk in order to find proof that the senator took a bribe, the reporter can be prosecuted for wiretapping in violation of federal law or burglary in, vi in violation of law, even though his reason for doing it is to get information to the public and as a member of the press. And this is a basic principle of First Amendment law. As a general rule, you do not have a right to violate a general law because you want to do it for purposes of exercising your First Amendment rights. So if you want to get to a lecture on time, you can't speed. If you're caught speeding and tell the police officer, I'm, I'm rushing to get to a lecture, the First Amendment protects me, <laughs> you lose. Or if you want to protest state laws about obscenity, and so you choose to march down Main Street naked in violation of laws prohibiting public nudity, you lose. You cannot violate the laws against public nudity by walking down Main Street naked, even if you're doing so as a form of political protest. And similarly, the reporter cannot engage in wiretapping, or burglary, and by extension of the same principle, I would say, cannot engage in bribery or coercion or fraud. And so the reporter can be put in jail for engaging in that activity. The second category are situations in which the reporter encourages or incites or tries to persuade the public employee to disclose classified information. Now this is a very tricky situation because it is a crime ordinarily to solicit others to commit a criminal act. If I try to persuade you to commit murder, if I try to persuade you to commit assault, if I try to persuade you to embezzle money from your employer, I am committing a crime. And the logic therefore would apply the same to the reporter. A reporter who attempts to persuade a public employee to violate the law by disclosing classified information and is prosecuted under a non-solicitation, that is, you may not solicit crimes statute, it looks a lot like, indeed virtually identical to, my examples of bribery and wiretapping and uh, coercion. Here I would argue, however, that the act of persuading public employees to disclose information is so long and traditionally a part of the news gathering activity of the press that to punish that information in this situation would so deeply intrude on the ability of the press to gather information 
keeping in mind that the only reason we're allowing the government to make this a crime by the public employee is because of simplicity, not because it's otherwise sound public policy in terms of balancing public interest against national security, that at least where the reporter refrains from engaging in sort of active criminal conduct like bribery or fraud or coercion and limits himself or herself solely to persuasion, that even though that technically violates laws against solic soliciting crimes, the First Amendment should protect that conduct. And the third situation involves the receipt of information, the passive receipt, and this is the easiest of the three. If a public employee mails anonymously to a reporter the Pentagon Papers, the, the reporter, by receiving that information and not returning it to its lawful owner, the government, is violating the ordinary criminal law against receiving stolen goods. And the basic principles of criminal law, again, could apply, in theory, to the reporter who merely receives that information and doesn't promptly return it to its lawful owner. But again, I would argue that the extension of the criminal law in that situation to the reporter so deeply intrudes on the ability of the press to report on information that it should be held to violate the First Amendment. But part of what's surprising, and, and I want to underscore, is that the second and third situations are not so, not so easy. That in fact, if I were a lawyer representing the government, I would be able to make a pretty strong argument that a reporter who encourages a government employee to disclose confidential information or even passively receives that information and doesn't return it, can in fact constitutionally be punished. And although I believe that's the wrong answer, it's important to note that that's not an issue that's been resolved in the law. And it is in fact an issue that will have to be resolved if the administration insists on uh, prosecuting uh, reporters for their participation in the revelation of this kind of uh, disclosed information. I think at this point I'll stop and simply allow and invite some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. And you've given us a lot, I think, to think about and I hope talk about. Um, we have somewhere here two people with microphones. Yes? Do we? There's one. There's two. And so if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand and one of our able microphone folks will lend you a microphone. Hi, uh, thanks a lot. And my question is, does the government have the power to go after um, the press to find out the name of, or of a contact who leaked information, kind of like an aiding and abetting? A crime situation? The, so the question you ask is do they have the ability to get, get reporters to disclose the information? Yeah. Um, it's a complicated question. Uh, the Supreme Court held 30 odd years ago, 35 years ago, that the First Amendment does not recognize a robust reporter privilege in this situation. That means that if the government has a legitimate reason for investigating a leak, it may demand that a reporter disclose the source of the information that he or she published. And the Judy Miller um, situation is a good example of the application of that Logic. Now, the reason the court reached the result it did in a five to four decision was really two considerations. One of them I already hinted at in my talk, which is that when a law is of general application, the people exercising their First Amendment rights will rarely be granted an exemption from that law merely because they are exercising First Amendment rights. And so the claim of the reporter not to have to turn over information to a grand jury 
because the reporter says that will impair my ability to gather news is a little bit like the reporter saying I have a right to wiretap or to burgle in violation of law because doing those activities will help me gather news and I should be given an exemption from that ordinary requirement. And so the same reasoning in general terms that applies to the wiretap or the burglary example also applies to the reporter's privilege situation. And the court invokes that argument in the Brandsburg case. And the second factor that the court was concerned about had to do with the problem of defining who is the press for purposes of the First Amendment. If we recognize a reporter's privilege under the First Amendment, then we have to define who is entitled to assert that privilege as a matter of First Amendment law. Is a reporter for the New York Times entitled? Is a reporter for the University of Minnesota school newspaper? Is a blogger? Is a scholar who is working on research? Is a person who is um, writing a uh, a newsletter for uh, mailing on Christmas to their family friends. Uh, who's the press and who's not the press as a First Amendment matter? And the court has very much wanted to avoid that problem. Now here I have to make a confession. The argument that I made a moment ago that the press should have a right to solicit information from government employees including the disclosure of classified information, raises the same problem. If we recognize that a reporter has the First Amendment right to solicit that information, then we again have to say, well, who's a reporter? Is any person who solicits from a public employee classified information automatically the press? Would that include, for example, a spy for the terrorist? Would a spy for the terrorist who tries to persuade a government employee with access to confidential information to give him that confidential information be entitled to solicit that information on the theory that, hey, I'm in the press. And suppose he, instead of turning the information secretly over to Al-Qaeda, which would make him a classic spy, suppose instead he puts it on a website. So he gets the information as a spy that reveals the ports that are inadequately protected. And he puts it on a website, a blog, to disclose it to everyone. If a reporter did that, my argument would suggest he should be protected by the First Amendment. What about the spy who does exactly the same thing but his motives for doing so are not, in fact, to inform the public, but are, in fact, to convey the information to Al-Qaeda. That problem, who is the press, who gets the privilege, is a very complicated one. And it's part of the reason why the court decided it was inadvisable to recognize a First Amendment privilege. Now, the other level at which your answer to your question has to do with statute law. 49 states and the District of Columbia have recognized in one way or another, and in varying forms, a journalist source privilege that gives reporters a certain degree of authority to refuse to disclose the identity of a source because the states or the District of Columbia have decided as a matter of public policy that there is value in not requiring reporters to disclose those sources, at least in some circumstances. And so the answer to your question will turn on what state we're talking about. Some states have different privileges than other states. The federal government has no privilege. Up to this point in time, Congress has declined to enact a federal reporter's privilege of any sort. As a consequence, the only argument a reporter could make in a federal investigation would be the First Amendment argument. And as I've just said, the First Amendment privilege, to the extent it exists at all, is a very weak one. And this is an issue that Congress is considering sort of now. 
and absolutely, in my view, should enact legislation that recognizes a robust reported privilege. But right now, there is no federal privilege, and that's exactly why someone like Judy Miller had to spend um, 86 odd days in prison uh, because of the absence of any federal privilege that would protect reporters in a federal investigation. Uh, sir, you had made a distinction um, uh, between the the private. I can't see who's. Oh, okay, yeah, uh, yeah. Gotcha. The okay. private employee and the government employee. The federal government contracts out so many services today. Uh, have any cases arisen involving the status of a private employee working under a federal government uh, contract? Great question. Um, to what extent? is a private employee who works for a government contractor in effect thought of as analogous to a private employee and to what extent is he thought of as analogous to a public employee? And the answer, I think, depends upon who is insisting upon the condition. If the private employer is independently insisting upon the waiver of some right, entirely of its own volition, then it would be free to do so in much the same way that any other private employer would be free to do it. If the government is insisting as a condition of being willing to contract with the private employer, that the private employer impose that condition on its employees, then the, the contractor would be considered essentially in the same way that the government would be considered, because it's the government who's initially imposing the requirement. In between those two relatively simple situations are, of course, the much more difficult factual problems where the question is, well, the government doesn't say it insists upon the condition, but the, the contractor knows that it's more likely to get the contract if it has that condition than if it doesn't, and that gets to be just a very difficult factual situation. But I think the, the inquiry is really whose impetus is the decision to put the condition on the employee. If it comes entirely from the private employer, then it should be treated like a private employer arrangement, and if it comes from the government, it clearly should be regarded as if it comes from the government. And then in the middle, there is that difficult factual question. Sure. Hi. Uh, my name is Professor uh, Bill McGovern from the law school. Um, um, you anticipated my question with your answer to the first one, which is, you know, we live in the era of smokinggun.com and Drudge Report, and not just in the area of reporters' privilege, but it seems to me inevitable that at some point in the not-too-distant future, a scenario like what played out with the New York Times and the Washington Post is going to occur where the entity revealing the information is not a traditional institutional media outlet, but is some muckraking blogger or website. Um, on, on the one hand, your remarks talk about the New York Times and the Washington Post repeatedly, and you're clearly relying to some extent on the structured editorial processes of those institutions. On the other hand, you're making some principled arguments about the public interest in knowing the information. How does this change your analysis of what the law is or should be? The traditional press was not the New York Times and the Washington Post. Uh, it was much more like bloggers. Um, and the, the development of mainstream media of the sort we now identify with the Times and the Post is a relatively recent phenomenon. But the press as it existed, certainly at the time the First Amendment was adopted, was like a bunch of bloggers, except they used paper. And they were highly partisan and, and not very professional and very small. Uh, and so I, I would say that, that there is a concern, insofar as one, one's vision of the press is of mainstream, professionalized, responsible entities. It's easier, in some sense, to say that we should give them a great deal of authority to decide what to publish and what not to publish because we have some measure of trust in their exercising patriotic, reasonable judgment. When we instead think of the media as any Tom, Dick, and Harry who could afford a computer, um, then we don't have the same degree of confidence in the judgment of those individuals because they're not necessarily professional and they don't have the same institutional stakes that the mainstream media have. So I think that does complicate the question. Uh, if we asked the question 200 years ago, uh, 
we wouldn't worry about this, but if we asked it 30 years ago, we would have a very different vision of what the media might be. So I think that's a relevant factor to be cognizant of, but not, at the moment at least, to shape the law. In terms of the rights of bloggers versus, to take the paradigm, the New York Times or the Washington Post, um, there's, there's two different contexts in which the question arises. One is if you were making a statutory rule about the reporter's privilege, and the question was, as a matter of statute, who gets to assert a privilege? I think it would be maybe not wise, but not unconstitutional or necessarily even irresponsible to say that it includes certain types of mainstream media defined in some way, but it doesn't include the every time that Tom, Dick, and Harry who publishes a, a one-page newsletter or a blog. And the reason I would say that is because in the reporter's privilege situation, what you're really looking for is the opportunity for sources to have the ability to disclose confidential information to some entity that can bring it to the public. And as long as that goal is achieved, it doesn't mean that every member of the press, however defined, has to have the same privilege. The, the real interest in the reporter's privilege is in making sure sources are able to get information out to the public. It's not the interest of the New York Times or the blogger. It's the source whose interest is really at stake. So there, I think one could, if one wanted to, distinguish between bloggers and mainstream media. And bloggers would be unhappy, but I don't think that would pose a, a constitutional problem because it discriminates against bloggers. On the other hand, if one's talking about a definition of the First Amendment in the context of, say, a First Amendment reporter's privilege, or a First Amendment right of individuals to solicit information from public employees where the disclosure would be of classified material, there I think as a practical matter you can't interpret the First Amendment so as to say it covers the New York Times but not a blogger. I think the right test there should be a very functional one. If the entity or the individual is seeking the information for the purpose of disclosing it to a more general audience, then that's the press. And that would certainly include bloggers in the same way that it would include the New York Times. And uh, I think so, so, so I think as a statutory matter, there's greater freedom to adopt a, a definition than as a First Amendment matter. As a First Amendment matter, I think it, it has to be defined very broadly to encompass anyone who could claim the freedom of the press, and that would include um, almost anyone in this room if they were engaged in the activity of seeking information in order to convey it to a larger audience by whatever technology they chose to use. Over here? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. A question like uh, about a couple of years ago, the uh, Ambassador Joe Wilson situation, and is there borderline with the issue of uh, whistleblowers is affecting uh, information and the uh, lack of uh, informative disclosure? I'm sorry, I heard you talk about J Joe Wilson. I didn't hear His the last wife, part. I believe, was supposedly outed as a as a uh, right, Valerie Plame, woman. right? Yes, and apparently, if I recall, I don't remember all of the facts, but uh, a journalist by the name of uh, Richard Novak, and I guess several other people in the chain of communications, uh, information uh, dissemination, and the issue. How did how would you place? Where would you place that kind of classification in your paradigm of information? Right. So the Thank question you. is, is, is the, the, the disclosure of Valerie Plame's identity as a CIA agent, um, how does that fit within the, the realm of the situations I talked about earlier? I would say that if the government had chose to have a law that prohibited the public employees from disclosing the status of a covert CIA agent, that that law could constitutionally be enforced against government employees, including people like those in the White House, um, in the same way that the disclosure of uh, 
any other classified information that could have the potential to harm the national security would be punishable. The difficulty in the real case is that there is not a statute that makes it unlawful to disclose that information except in very narrow circumstances. So the government chose to exercise a, a degree of restraint in, in prohibiting the disclosure of that information and therefore it's, it's actually very difficult to violate the law in that context. So if Richard Armitage, for example, or, or Scooter Liberty or, or anyone else disclosed Valerie Plame's identity, uh, in my view, it would be permissible to punish them for doing so if there was a law that actually prohibited it, that conduct. But one of the difficulties in the investigation that uh, Patrick Fitzgerald encountered is that the statute that deals with uh, prohibitions on the disclosure of the identities of CIA agents is a very technical and narrow statute and probably was not violated in that situation. There's a question in the back? Should be the last one, Jane, or do you want? Okay, two, yeah, fine. Your, your first one, Jane. Uh, what precise uh, rule of law, aside from reasoning aside that the Bush administration uses, because I know he talks about national security tools to fight terrorism, and uh, what does he cite exactly to defend the actions of the NSA? And you yourself, you say that you see uh, illegality in those actions. What rules of law do you see or cite when you take your position? Okay, so the question is, this is, takes a little bit of time to answer, but it's important. Um, it's, it's what is the, what are the arguments about whether the president's authorization to the National Security Agency to engage in uh, surveillance uh, of communications without getting a warrant and without probable cause are either lawful or unlawful? So there's two levels in which one can ask the question. First is, is it unconstitutional for the president to authorize wiretaps or electronic surveillance of email without a warrant or probable cause. Because clearly the NSA was authorized to do this monitoring without having to get a judicial warrant and without a requirement of probable cause. So does that violate the Fourth Amendment, which prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures? And the Supreme Court has held that wiretapping is a search that wiretapping ordinarily requires probable cause and a warrant, and it has expressly rejected the argument of the executive branch that national security wiretaps are exempt from the Fourth Amendment requirement of probable cause and a warrant. However, the court has left open and not yet resolved the question as to whether foreign intelligence wiretaps should be thought outside the ordinary scope of the Fourth Amendment. So one argument is that the president violated the Fourth Amendment in authorizing this electronic monitoring without a warrant and probable cause on the ground that ordinarily there has to be those procedures and the Supreme Court has rejected unanimously the claim that there are national security exemptions and the argument in favor of the Bush administration is that the Supreme Court has never decided the issue of whether foreign intelligence investigations are exempt from the warrant and probable cause requirements. And that's simply an open question. So neither side can tell, can say it's clearly unconstitutional or it's clearly constitutional. The force of the Supreme Court's decision that rejected the national security argument for not having to comply with the warrant and probable cause requirement logically would seem to apply to foreign intelligence, but in fact, the court left that question open. Okay, the second and more direct point is that Congress enacted legislation in 1978, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which authorized the creation of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. And the court was created to deal with the issue of foreign intelligence surveillance. The, the issue that was left open by the Supreme Court in deciding on the meaning of the Fourth Amendment. So Congress passed legislation that said that 
the president may engage in foreign intelligence wiretaps, but to do so, he must have a judicial warrant issued on the basis of probable cause to believe that a party to the communication is a foreign agent with the warrant being issued by the special FISA court, which is designed to have particular protections of the secrecy of the proceedings. And it made very clear this was the exclusive means by which the president is allowed to engage in foreign intelligence surveillance. The NSA surveillance program flatly and unequivocally violates the 1978 law. The president has made two arguments in his defense as to why he says this was not a criminal act on his part, because the statute is a criminal statute. Um, first, he argues that when Congress, after 9-11, adopted the authorization to use military force, authorizing the president to use military force to retaliate against those who were responsible for 9-11, that by enacting that resolution, they effectively authorized him to engage in, among other things, not only attacking Afghanistan, but also engaging in foreign intelligence surveillance without regard to the 1978 statute, Im implicitly authorized that. That argument, although made repeatedly by the administration, is entirely bogus. And the reason it's entirely bogus is that the 1978 statute anticipated a declaration of war. The statute itself says, in case of a declaration of war, the president is allowed to circumvent FISA and conduct foreign intelligence monitoring for a period not to exceed 15 days, during which time he can seek an amendment of FISA from Congress if he wishes to pursue that. Well, the president has been authorizing NSA surveillance in violation of FISA now for four years. And clearly, the authorization to use military force is not more than a declaration of war. So if a declaration of war, clearly under the statute, did not allow any more than 15-day exemption, the authorization to use military force, which says nothing whatsoever about surveillance, uh, certainly could not reasonably be interpreted to do more than a war declaration. The second argument the president has made is that as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, under Article II, he has the implicit power to engage in foreign intelligence surveillance in whatever circumstances he believes proper in order to protect the national security of the United States without regard to any congressional legislation, any federal legislation, because it's not just Congress, it was signed by a president, uh, any federal legislation to the contrary. Uh, this argument is also bogus, although it had initially some authority to it. There is some power that the president has as commander-in-chief that Congress cannot intrude upon. That is, there's a core of the commander-in-chief power so that if the president decided to send in the Marines rather than the Army when we invaded Iraq, Congress could not constitutionally enact legislation that said, no, he must send in the Army instead of the Marines. That would so directly intrude on the commander-in-chief power that it would probably be held to violate Article II. Um, however, the Supreme Court has never held a law unconstitutional on the ground that it violates the president's commander-in-chief power and has often held actions of the president, not just this president, others as well, unlawful on the ground that it was prohibited by federal law and not authorized by the Article II power. Since the war on terrorism began, the Supreme Court has made crystal clear, both in the, in the Hamdi decision and in the Hamdan decision, two different cases, that the president's authority as commander-in-chief does not give him authority to, as Justice O'Connor put it, uh, write himself a blank check to disregard congressional legislation. Um, so in the Hamdi case, uh, 
the Supreme Court held that the President could not lawfully, as Commander-in-Chief, choose to hold an American citizen captured on the battlefield in Afghanistan without giving that individual a hearing to determine whether, in fact, he was a combatant or simply a bystander. Although the President had claimed that his power as Commander-in-Chief gave him the authority to refuse to grant even an American citizen a hearing on that question. And in the Hamdan case, this, this past June, the Supreme Court um, rejected the uh, creation of military commissions by the President uh, that deviated from the military commissions that Congress had created in the Uniform Code of Military Justice, uh, holding that the President does not have the authority to disregard the requirements that the Congress put in place for military commissions, including the rights of defendants in those proceedings, and that for the President to unilaterally disregard the Uniform Code of Military Justice uh, was not within his power as Commander-in-Chief. And so those decisions make very clear that in, in, in putting in place the NSA surveillance um, program in violation of FISA, uh, the President was violating the FISA statute and was not authorized to do so by Article 2. So those are the arguments of both sides, and that's why I would resolve them. In the context of your discussion with respect to the publication of government data, uh, whether it's criminal or not, you articulated certain standards like clear and imminent danger to national security, other terms you use, serious government interests, limited value to the public. If I were a government employee or a journalist and contemplating an act, I would like to know how much of what you've proposed as a standard has solid precedent in law as opposed to the arguments of an academic. So if I'm going before a court, I would know a little more what my chances are. Um, the argument about the criminal prosecution of the press is not, what I, I used the word should and, and sort of underscored it verbally when I described the law, that the law should be. Uh, the law with respect to public employees is that they can be punished as it currently stands in the circumstances I described. Because there has never been a criminal prosecution of the press in the history of the United States for publishing classified or confidential government information, there is no precedent that directly addresses that question. So one has to argue, obviously, by analogy to other situations. The closest analogy to this circumstance would be the Pentagon Papers decision, where the Supreme Court held that the government could not enjoin the publication of the Pentagon Papers without showing a direct and immediate harm to a grave national security concern, and that that standard was not satisfied in the Pentagon Papers case. The government could and would argue that the Pentagon Papers precedent is not applicable to a case of criminal prosecution of the press, and that a lesser standard would be justified in a criminal prosecution than in an injunction or prior restraint situation. And the reason why the government would argue to that effect is that the concept of prior restraint is deeply embedded in the history of the First Amendment because traditionally, the, or historically, the restrictions on free speech took the form of licensing, where the government in the 16th and 17th centuries essentially said that it's a crime for any person to publish a book without first getting a license from the government. And the key element of that requirement was a prior restraint. That is, you would be punished for publishing a book without the license, period. So you have to take your book to the licensor, they get to look at it, they get to scratch out the material they don't want you to publish, and you then can publish it only if you, in fact, eliminate the material that's been censored. And if you publish without going to the licensor, you automatically violate the law because you haven't complied with the licensing scheme. You can't disregard the requirement that you get a license and then later claim, but I would have gotten a license anyway. It would be a little bit like 
not getting a driver's license and afterwards saying, well, I can drive, so what's the problem? Uh, it doesn't work. You have to get the license. And you can be punished for not getting the license, even if you're a good driver. So that was the, that was the concept of prior restraint, meaning you were restrained from publishing prior to the publication itself. And if you disobeyed the requirement of getting a license, you committed a crime. The same feature exists with injunctions. In the Pentagon Papers case, the government sought to enjoin the publication, went to federal court and sought an injunction against the New York Times to order it not to publish the Pentagon Papers, rather than waiting for the Times to publish and then criminally prosecuting them. And an injunction operates in very much the same way as licensing. That is, if a court issues an injunction against you, whether it's about free speech or anything else, doesn't matter, you may not violate the injunction and then claim later the injunction was illegal. Just as with a, license, a licensing scheme, you must obey the injunction. And if you choose to violate the injunction, you can be criminally punished or held in contempt, even if the injunction was in fact illegal. The way to challenge the injunction under the law is to appeal not to violate it. Therefore, the injunction works the same way as a license, in the sense that it's a prior restraint, you're frozen. At the moment the injunction issues, if you choose to publish in violation of that injunction, you will go to jail, even if the injunction was unlawful. This, by the way, was a very important Supreme Court precedent established uh, in 1931 in Near versus Minnesota, which involved um, newspapers in Minneapolis, um, which, uh, this is exactly 75 years ago now, come to think of it. Um, so we should be celebrating here in Minnesota this, this year. <laughs> in fact, the only prior time, or the first time I actually came to the University of Minnesota, not the only time, the first, prior, first time I came here was to a, a 50th anniversary um, symposium about New University of Minnesota about 25 years ago. Um, in, in any event, so the Pentagon Papers case was a prior restraint against the New York Times, which is why the New York Times obeyed it. The New York Times, remember, did not publish the Pentagon Papers. They stopped publishing it once the injunction was issued until the Supreme Court held the injunction was unlawful. They appealed rather than violating it. And had they violated it, they could have been punished for contempt of court even if the injunction, in fact, was unlawful. So injunctions, as a form of prior restraint, are regarded as especially pernicious under the First Amendment. In a criminal case, if there is a criminal statute and you violate it by publishing, say, the National Security Agency story as the New York Times and you're prosecuted after the publication, you can claim in your defense that the statute cannot constitutionally be applied to you and that it's unconstitutional to punish you for publishing that information. So a criminal statute, maybe surprisingly to those of you who aren't lawyers, does not operate in the way an injunction operates. You can violate the criminal law and raise in your defense that the law could not constitutionally be applied to you. Therefore, if you want to take the gamble of violating a criminal law, you can do so. And if you're right, you will not be punished. You'll be vindicated, unlike the situation with an injunction. Therefore, the government would argue in a prosecution of the New York Times for publishing the story about the National Security Agency, that the Pentagon Papers decision should not apply. That that is a standard that was applicable to an injunction, but a criminal prosecution, a lower standard should apply. So if I were the lawyer making a very lawyerly argument, now that's the argument I would make. I don't believe that argument would carry any weight today. In the 35 years since the Pentagon Papers decision, the, the law has become, I think, very clear that the standard that the court applied there for prior restraints is the standard with respect to even criminal punishments after the fact. So I would say with a 99% confidence that the standard of clear and present danger of a grave harm, 95% confidence since Alito was confirmed, 95% um, confidence <clears throat> that the court would hold it, that is the standard for criminally punishing the media for, pu for, for publishing um, classified information. Uh, but, it, but because that issue has never been litigated in the United States, uh, it is an open question in the way I've described. 
come back in 25 years and tell us how the Supreme Court settles it, Jeffrey. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And now, let me remind you that uh, immediately following this event, we'll be having a book signing out in the lobby for at least as long as Jeffrey can hold up. So uh, please join us for re uh, uh, refreshments and a book signing. Thank you. <laughs>